Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Come on in. Welcome to the Law of Self-Defense show, an early, early show today. Glad to have you all on board. Good heaven, Shane is here, our moderator. Thank you very much, Shane, for being here so early. I really appreciate that. So for those who don't know, I am, of course, attorney Andrew Branca for Law of Self-Defense. Thank you. Thank you. Can't tell you how much I appreciate all that. Let's see. Turn off the volume of these other streams. That would always be good. And uh, all right. So today we are here to talk about a case out of Minnesota that happened just in the last uh, couple of days. A security guard at a store shot and killed a, uh, I'll call him a suspect, someone who got into a confrontation with the security guard at the store. Uh, for failure to uh, follow store policies and then resisting being um, excluded, removed from uh, the premises. And the uh, one of the two security guards involved ended up, uh, well, one ended up getting shot and killed by the suspect, and then the other security guard shot and killed the suspect. So um, under circumstances that certainly appear to be a lawful use of force by the second security guard, but as it turns out, the second security guard, uh, his firearm his handgun was not lawfully possessed so the question becomes uh, if the killing itself was uh, otherwise lawful self-defense does that change or are there alternative charges that could be brought against the security guard who fired the shot because he was not in fact in lawful possession of the gun under the circumstances is there a crime there and uh, I'm going to talk about the Minnesota case that just happened, uh, but I'm going to put that in context by a much older case. You need to be a certain age, folks, a certain vintage to remember this older case, but it's the case of Bernard Getz in New York City. Bernie Getz, subway shooter, so-called, um, had a similar conundrum. So he shot four young men on a subway, under circumstances in which it certainly appeared that the shootings themselves were lawful, but his possession of the gun in uh, 1984 or 19, yeah, 1984 New York City um, was unlawful. His five shot revolver, his possession of it was unlawful. So, is there a crime? Is his does his shooting of the four young men become unlawful because his possession of the gun was unlawful? Let's explore those dynamics. And while doing that, I'm going to share with you some kind of inside baseball stuff in the Bernard Getz case that you're, you probably don't know because, of course, it wasn't reported by the media um, to illustrate just how uh, the legal system can railroad a criminal defendant, in this case, Bernie Getz, if they want to. And the whole world will be blind to it because, of course, most of the world only knows what the media tells them. And the media either is uh, too stupid and or uh, too maliciously intended uh, to genuinely inform the public about these kinds of use of force cases. Uh, I will mention, of course, uh, the sponsor of today's show is none under none other <laughs> than law of self-defense itself. <clears throat> and in the form of our book, The Law of Self-Defense, best-selling book. You can find it on Amazon.com. It's got over a 1,000 reviews, solid five-star rating. You can order it on Amazon.com, but instead we recommend you order it from us because Amazon will charge you for the book and shipping and handling. We'll give you the book for free. We do still ask that you cover the cost of getting the book to you, so we ask that you cover the shipping and handling. This is a real physical book, folks. It's not just some PDF download thing. Get this book for free. We normally charge $25 for it. We eat the cost of the book if you'll simply pay the cost of getting the book to you. The Law of Self-Defense, authored, of course, by me, attorney Andrew Branca with a foreword by Mas Ayub. And if you don't know who Mas Ayub is, you ought to. Uh, very, very well-respected self-defense trainer uh, in the community for many, many decades. A man I consider a friend and a mentor. So you can get that book for free at lawofselfdefense.com slash free book. That's lawofselfdefense.com slash free book. 
So the event I want to share with all of you uh, just occurred within um, the last couple of days. It was reported on yesterday, July 21st, 2022, in the evening. Uh, it appears that the actual event occurred a couple of weeks later, but we still uh, we just had a decision out of the um, county district attorney's office about this case on whether or not to bring charges. So that's why it's back in the headlines. But a very recent case, regardless, earlier this month took place in Milwaukee. Oh, I think uh, in the comments, I may have said this was in Minnesota. Obviously, Milwaukee is, in fact, in Wisconsin. My mistake I'll, I'll correct the comments after the fact. But a Milwaukee security guard, I'm reading now from the news article, quote, a Milwaukee security guard will not be charged in a fatal shooting that took place after the man he eventually killed had shot and killed a fellow security guard. The Milwaukee County District Attorney's Office cleared Enoch Wilson in the July 9th death of suspect Louise Lorenzo, who was killed in the parking lot of a grocery store. What a way to go. Uh, the incident began when the suspect, Lorenzo, became embroiled in a dispute with a different security guard, Anthony Nolden, 59 years old. So here's Anthony Nolden working an honest job doing security in a grocery store at the age of 59. Anthony Nolden, 59 years old, dealing with this suspect, Lorenzo, who's more than 20 years his junior, Quote, the district attorney's office said that Anthony Nolden, the 59-year-old security guard, told Lorenzo, the 36-year-old suspect, that he could not bring a shoulder bag into the store because store policy prohibits them. Close quote. Now, why do you think store policy prohibits the bringing in of bags, folks? Because of theft, because of shoplifting, because the store is fed up with people coming in and stuffing their bags full of merchandise and then walking out without paying. So the store prohibits the bringing of these bags into the, onto their premises. Is the store privileged to make that a condition of entering their store? Now, normally a store, a grocery store of this nature, uh, is providing implicit license to the public to come in. They want the public to come in to shop there, of course. So when you normally walk into the store, you're doing so with implicit license, meaning you're not trespassing. You're there with permission. But you're only there with permission if you're entering in accordance with the conditions the store sets for that license to enter. And one of those conditions was you can't bring a shoulder bag into the store. If the store offers license to enter the premises and have it not be trespassing and then sets conditions for that license to enter and you violate the conditions are you trespassing yes because now you're entering the property without license without permission because you're in violation of the conditions for that license to enter the property you're trespassing by the way folks for those of you who concealed carry concealed carry um, on premises that are posted no concealed carry this is a risk that you run as well of course in some states that no gun posting on the store could have its own criminal liability that depends on the jurisdiction. But even if we presume there's no criminal liability, that this is purely a private matter, a civil matter when uh, a premises posts no guns. Well, when they post no guns, they're also setting a condition for the license to enter the store. So this same grocery store, if we imagine that they had a no guns sign on the front of the store, if you enter with your otherwise lawfully concealed firearm, knowing that the store does not want you to do that, knowing that not having a gun on the premises is a condition of the license to be able to enter the store and not have it be trespassing, guess what, folks? You violate that policy. You are trespassing when you enter the store in violation of that policy. You are not there by license. You are not there with permission. Now, of course, if you're carrying concealed, Presumably, the store never knows, so nothing will come out of it. Uh, most, mostly, this is phrased along the lines of, well, you know, it's not a problem unless the store tells you to leave, and then if you don't leave, it's trespassing. Technically, folks, it's trespassing the moment you enter the store knowing you're violating the policy. Now, as a practical matter, the store doesn't want to go after people for trespassing under these circumstances. They'll simply want you to leave, so they won't press trespassing 
unless you refuse to leave. But make no mistake, you are trespassing the moment you enter contrary to the license to enter the premises. So here we have suspect Lorenzo, security card Nolden. Uh, Nolden tells Lorenzo, you can't come in the store with the bag. And of course, Lorenzo enters the building with the bag anyway. This results in an argument between security guard Nolden and suspect Lorenzo. Fortunately, there's more than one security guard. And a second security guard comes up. The second security guard is Wilson, Enoch Wilson. Enoch Wilson happens to be armed. He's armed with a gun. And being a prudent gentleman, he's also armed with pepper spray. Uh, both guards are armed with pepper spray. Uh, so when Nolden and Lorenzo, Nolden the security guard, Lorenzo the suspect, begin to have their confrontation, Lorenzo brings the bag into the store, contrary to policy, as he's been told by security guard Nolden. Nolden pepper sprays Lorenzo, the non-compliant Lorenzo. Lorenzo then runs out into the parking lot, and he's followed by Nolden with his pepper spray. So Lorenzo's in the parking lot. He's been OC'd. Nolden has followed him out into the parking lot. The second security guard, Enoch Wilson, also arrives on the scene, grabs the OC Lorenzo, and tries to get him onto the ground, presumably so he can be arrested by arriving police. Frankly, folks, <clears throat> I would not be doing this, I don't think. Uh, first of all, if you, if you OC somebody and they're soaked in OC, about the last thing in the world I want to be doing is touching that person. Uh, then you get cross-contamination. You're also effectively OC'd. Your clothing is OC'd. It's just not a good place to be. Um, and what's going to happen to this guy, Lorenzo, anyway? So what are you really accomplishing? You got him out of the store. You did your job. Awesome. Uh, but in any case, Wilson tries to, um, the second security guard, Enoch Wilson, tries to get Lorenzo onto the ground. Uh, after a struggle, he does get Lorenzo face down, straddles him on the ground, but Lorenzo still had his bag. And guess what was in the bag? A gun. Now, is Lorenzo a convicted felon who the law says is prohibited from being in possession of a gun? He sure is. And that's a gun control law I think you know, many people would agree with, even many Second Amendment supporters would agree with, that convicted felons ought not be in possession of a gun. I'll be honest, that's not my position. My position, my personal position, is that if someone's been convicted of a felony, they serve their time, they're released from prison, they ought to get their civil rights back. And that would include the right to possess a gun. The wrinkle in my position, of course, is that we often release these felonies before we can have a reasonable expectation that they're no longer felonious. So it becomes a dilemma. Do we, uh, if we're willing to release a convicted felon from prison, in my view, that ought to be because we don't think they're dangerous anymore. And if we don't think they're dangerous anymore, they ought to get their civil rights back, including their right to have a gun to defend themselves. If we do think they're still dangerous and therefore would not want them to have a gun in public after release, we ought not release them. They're dangerous. So that's my position. Either keep the felon in prison because he's dangerous and we're trying to keep society safe or decide he's no longer dangerous and release him and then give him his civil rights back. But in any case, Lorenzo, under the actual laws, gun laws of America, not the laws I would enact, um, is a convicted felon. He's pr a prohibited person um, for purposes of being in possession of a firearm. Despite this, guess what, folks? Bad guys don't obey gun laws. Uh, he nevertheless despite being a prohibited person, had a gun in his bag. He retrieves the gun while he's on his stomach, being straddled by security guard Enoch Wilson. Suspect Lorenzo retrieves his gun, blindly fires one shot upwards, and poor security guard Anthony Nolden, 59 years old, catches that round, and it kills him. So Anthony Nolden, working a job, almost certainly not making very much money, working a job for security for a grocery store, 59 years old, gets killed dead by this dirtbag Lorenzo for no particularly good reason. That's reality, folks. Now, of course, uh, Nolden, arguably, he did take the job as security. He was doing that job. Uh, you take the job, you take the risks. 
doesn't of course that doesn't mean the shooting is right the shooting as far as i'm concerned is is at best manslaughter arguably murder um but this could happen to any of us folks uh, as i always say the moment you go hands-on in a confrontation you are incurring two risks you were not incurring a moment before one is dying in the confrontation i assure you that when anthony nolden approached suspect lorenzo about his bag Nolden had zero expectation he was going to end up a few minutes later shot dead in the parking lot outside of his place of employment. But nevertheless, that's what happened. So suspect Lorenzo fired one shot at Nolden or blindly upwards, the media reports, kills security guard Anthony Nolden, 59 years old. Suspect Lorenzo also tries to shoot Enoch Wilson, uh, who's mounted on him on the ground, but Mrs. Wilson... At that point, Wilson, Enoch Wilson, then stood and shot Lorenzo with his with his own gun, with Wilson's own gun, and Lorenzo himself is killed. Uh, the district attorney's office says, quote, under these circumstances, Wilson's conduct, security guard Enoch Wilson, fell within the scope of the law of self-defense and defense of others, close quote. Yeah, it seems pretty clear to be the case, right? This is a lawful use of deadly defensive force. Um, certainly in defense of himself and to the extent that Enoch Wilson would have believed that others were in danger, perhaps he still believed that uh, Lorenzo, uh, not Lorenzo, the his colleague security guard, Nolden, uh, was still alive or still savable and still at risk from suspect Lorenzo. Of course, there are likely others in the parking lot, other customers in the store. They're all being endangered by Lorenzo with his gun. Um, that Wilson's justification was both self-defense and defense of others. Why? Because, of course, we have the five elements of self-defense here. Innocence, imminence, proportionality, avoidance, and reasonableness. We have innocence in that Lorenzo is the unlawful aggressor in this confrontation. The security guards are allowed to do what they're doing here. Um, their use of force is lawful. Lorenzo's use of deadly force here is unlawful. By the way, all that really matters is that Lorenzo's use of force is unlawful. That's the controlling factor in terms of innocence, in terms of the deadly force confrontation. So even if what the security guards had doing was excessive, uh, they were not inflicting deadly force on Lorenzo, so Lorenzo would have no privilege to resort to deadly force himself. And when Lorenzo unlawfully resorted to deadly force himself, that loses him innocence and the security guards are privileged to defend themselves against his unlawful use of deadly force. If what the security guards had done prior was unlawful in some respect, it would merely be non-deadly unlawful force. And there's other recourse for that than unlawfully shooting them in the parking lot. So the element of innocence is on the side of security guard Wilson uh, he was obviously facing an imminent threat. The threat of deadly force against him was either actually happening, it was actually happening, of course, or imminently about to happen. Both of those are really true here. Uh, in terms of the element of proportionality, Lorenzo had a gun and he was firing it. That's deadly force, deadly offensive force, and you're allowed to respond to deadly offensive force with deadly defensive force. That's the proportionality, deadly force to deadly force. In terms of avoidance, uh, I don't remember if Wisconsin is a duty to retreat state off the top of my head. Let me see if I can pull that up real quickly. Not that it would really matter because there's no opportunity to retreat safely when you are uh, in close proximity to an aggressor who is, uh, no, Wisconsin is not in any case a duty to retreat state. So it doesn't matter in terms of law either. But even if this had happened in a duty to retreat state, even when there exists a legal duty to retreat before you can use deadly force in self-defense, that duty is imposed only when retreat is possible with complete safety and you can't run faster than a bullet. If the aggressor is in close proximity with a gun, you can't outrun that gun's bullet. Safe retreat is not possible, so retreat is not required even in a duty to retreat state. That's the element of avoidance. Again, on the side of security guard Wilson, and finally, we have the um, umbrella element of reasonableness. Did Wilson have a genuine good faith belief that he was facing an imminent unlawful threat of deadly force harm? That's subjective reasonableness. And was that genuine good faith subjective belief 
objectively reasonable? Would a reasonable and prudent person in this position have shared that subjective belief? The answer to both those questions is yes. So the element of reasonableness also on Wilson's side. So he had all the elements required for the use of deadly defensive force against suspect Lorenzo. So Wilson, security guard Wilson, shooting of Lorenzo, a lawful use of deadly defensive force. Now, of course, Lorenzo's family has already retained uh, legal counsel for a civil suit. This civil suit, frankly, does not have much promise, uh, both in terms of the law and simply for practical reasons. Uh, the lawyer for Lorenzo's family bemoans, quote, these folks, meaning security guards, are not police officers, close quote. Uh, he's saying that like uh, that's a problem. I mean, there, nobody wishes that these security guards were police officers more than the family, uh, than the lawyer for the Lorenzo family. Because if they were police officers, then the Lorenzo family could sue the police department the, under in federal court under Section 1983 of federal code. And the police department would be likely to settle for some sum of money, regardless of the legal merits of the case. They have deep pockets. It's politicians controlling the purse springs. It's not politicians' own money. It's other people's money, taxpayer money, and politicians are generally more than happy to spend other people's money to make their own political problems go away. So it would not have surprised me at all if this had been a police shooting that their department, that the city, which whatever government entity would control the decision on whether to settle with Lorenzo's family, that they would have come to some settlement. And Lorenzo's family would have walked away with a big chunk of money, a third of which would have gone to their attorney who's bemoaning this fact. But they don't have that option because these were security guards, not police officers. Boo, hoo, hoo. So they'd have to sue either the officer, Wilson, who's not going to have any money, right? Fair enough to presume that as someone working a security guard job at a grocery store is not going to have millions of dollars you can sue them for. Uh, or they could sue the grocery store. But the grocery store... Their, their um, insurance company presumably would pay any settlement, um, but their, the insurance company is not politicians and they're not spending other people's money. They'd be spending their own money. So a much bigger uphill fight for pragmatic reasons as well as for legal reasons, even under civil law standards. Uh, it's pretty clear that security guard Wilson would have been privileged um, to shoot suspect Lorenzo dead. The legal standard, the five elements are the same in civil court as they are in criminal court. The only difference is how much proof you need to overcome a claim of self-defense. In criminal court, the state needs proof beyond a reasonable doubt that it was not self-defense. Let's pretend that's 90% proof that it was not self-defense, a very high standard. In civil court, the Lorenzo family would only need 51% evidence that it was not self-defense, but it's pretty clear that Wilson and the grocery store that employed him would have that here, uh, would be able to stop an attack well before, uh, stop an attempt to disprove self-defense uh, well before it ever got close to 51%. But nevertheless, we have the shakedown process happening here in civil court. The family's retained a lawyer. The lawyer's on contingency. He's not going to ask the family for any money unless he gets some kind of settlement. So there's no risk to the family to sue. And, uh, and maybe the lawyer can shake, uh, you know, who knows, a hundred grand, a million dollars out of the grocery store. And the, uh, the family walks away with a chunk of money and the lawyer walks away with a chunk of money, regardless of the legal merits of the case. That's how this civil court shakedown game works, folks. Uh, the article then states, uh, again, Lorenzo was a convicted felon, was not allowed to own firearms or be in possession of firearms. Of course, that didn't stop him, did it? So here's the thing. Um, we know now we can be very confident based on our impromptu five elements of self-defense law legal analysis that security guard Wilson's use of deadly force upon suspect Lorenzo was lawful, justified as lawful self-defense, meets all the required conditions of self-defense as we've discussed them. So the actual use of force by security guard Wilson on suspect Lorenzo, the fatal use of that force, the killing of Lorenzo, lawful based on a straight up self-defense and by the way defense of others would apply the same elements the only difference would be that the victim there would be some other person other than the uh, defender using the force against the criminal suspect so both self-defense defense of others viable compelling legal defenses here for this killing of suspect lorenzo 
And then we run into the wrinkle. The wrinkle is that, in fact, Wilson was not legally, security guard Wilson was also not legally in possession of the gun he used to kill suspect Lorenzo. So both men were in unlawful possession of their guns. Now, Wilson, security guard Wilson, had a gun permit for his gun, but it had expired less than two weeks before the shooting. Now, folks, I don't do gun law. I do use of force law. I particularly don't do Wisconsin um, gun law. But let's presume for purposes of discussion that the expiration of security guard Wilson's gun permit meant that him walking around with that gun out in public made it unlawful. That's the argument here. That's the concern here. Now, the Lorenzo family lawyer is saying, well, this two weeks ago expired gun permit, that's a big problem because, you know, misuse of firearms is a problem in our community and we should aggressively prosecute these gun crimes, these gun violence crimes, like walking around with a gun with a two-week expired gun permit. This is nonsense, of course. This is just part of the civil court shakedown the Lorenzo family attorney is engaged in. <clears throat> now, having said that, the question is, does the fact that security guard Wilson's possession of the gun, does that in any way make his use of the gun less lawful self-defense when he shot and killed Lorenzo? Does he lose the legal justification for his killing of suspect Lorenzo because the gun he used to kill Lorenzo was unlawfully in his possession at the time? And the answer, generally speaking, folks, is no, you don't lose self-defense simply because you happen at the same time you act in self-defense to be separately engaged in some unlawful conduct. Now, the other unlawful conduct could undermine your claim of self-defense if it undermines one of the required elements of self-defense. So if the other unlawful conduct is you're engaged in a robbery of somebody, well, yes, then you've lost the element of innocence. You're the unlawful criminal aggressor in that fight. But if we're talking about some, some unlawful conduct occurring at the same time, a, a contemporary, contemporaneous unlawful conduct that does not inherently undermine one of the five elements of self-defense, then the five elements of self-defense can still be viable. The claim of self-defense can still be viable, even though you're simultaneously doing something else that's unlawful. Here, the arguably unlawful other act is the unlawful possession of the gun by security guard Wilson because his gun permit had expired two weeks earlier. But that's not a criminal offense that would undermine any of the elements of self-defense in this case. So, Security guard Wilson's elements of self-defense still stand strong. Therefore, his justification for the use of deadly defensive force against Lorenzo still stands strong, even though he was indisputably, technically committing the separate offense of being unlawfully in possession of his gun. Now, as a practical matter, does this mean that security guard Wilson could be in the clear for having shot and killed suspect Lorenzo and still be criminally liable for the separate gun crime of being in unlawful possession of a gun in public. Yes, that could absolutely happen. He could be cleared for the killing, for the use of force charge of manslaughter or murder, and still be guilty of the separate criminal conduct of being in unlawful possession of the gun. Now, in this particular case, we have a statement from the district attorney's office, quote, Chief Deputy District Attorney Kent Lovern said the expired gun permit did not bar Wilson from owning a gun. So it was presumably a carry permit, not an own, not a um, ownership permit. Some states do require a permit merely to own a gun. Massachusetts, when I lived there, was one of those. Um, but in any case, this is an irrelevant point. The legal issue here would not be that security guard Wilson owned a gun. It would be that he was carrying the gun in public without the required permit. Uh, but in any case, the district attorney, deputy district attorney Lovren has said, under the circumstances created by Lorenzo's actions, Wilson's use of force was necessary. The bottom line is they don't intend to charge him with the gun crime. 
<clears throat> they don't really say that, at least not in the portion quoted here by the journalist. Of course, we always have to be very suspect of what journalists report. But the gist of it seems to be that security guard Wilson's not going to face a gun crime charge here. And if he doesn't, folks, it's not because he couldn't be compelled to face a gun law criminal charge. If the district attorney wanted that to happen, they appear to have Wilson on the merits for a gun crime if they wanted to prosecute him. But as I always caution, the prosecutors have effectively unlimited discretion on what charges they want to bring or not bring. And they need not justify it to anybody in any particular way, except presumably the voters that elect the district attorney to his office. But most voters have no idea who the district attorney is. These are generally low profile races. People tend not to get energized uh, by day to day prosecutorial decisions like this one. So what's happening here is the district attorney's office appears to simply be using their discretion to not charge security guard Wilson with a gun crime. Could they? Yes. They're simply choosing not to. Does the fact that they're choosing not to here mean they couldn't if you were in security guard Wilson's position? No. A different security guard on a different day might get a different discretionary decision from the prosecutor's office. They might well decide to go after you for unlawful possession of that gun, even if they didn't go after security guard Wilson the day before on otherwise the same exact facts in the case. So again, another reason why it's very, another example of why it's very dangerous to learn the law from these anecdotal cases. Some people might read about this case and say, hey, that security guard in, uh, <clears throat> in Wisconsin, um, you know, he was an unlawful possession of his gun, was in a lawful case of self-defense, and they didn't prosecute him for the gun crime. So that must mean you don't get prosecuted for gun crimes in these kinds of cases where your use of the gun was otherwise lawful. No, folks, that's not how it has to work out. You could easily be cleared on the actual use of force criminal charge and still be liable on the gun crime charge. And we have an example of that from history, from New York City, 1980s crime festival, New York City. I was living there at the time and fortunately also living there in the 1990s afterwards when the city was quite a different place under Mayor Rudy Giuliani, quite a safer place, quite a more pleasant place. Unfortunately, uh, at present, New York City appears to be spiraling back down to 1970s, 1980 status. But this case from 1980s New York City involved Bernard Getz. Bernie Getz, the so-called subway shooter. And it's a tale of how someone can have uh, be found to have used deadly defensive force lawfully but still be held legally accountable for having been in unlawful possession of the gun that they used to defend themselves. It's also a tale of how the criminal justice system can absolutely railroad a criminal defendant in the most brutal of ways, which is what happened to Bernie Getz. <clears throat> and interestingly enough, it could turn out that the judges making the decisions to railroad that criminal defenses are themselves scumbags who would later face criminal federal charges of kidnapping and be sentenced to federal prison. These are the people whose hands you're placing the rest of your life when you get engaged in that physical confrontation. People who would engage in charged federal kidnapping behavior. That was the judge who decided the fate of Bernard Getz in this case. When Bernard Getz had been cleared by a New York City grand jury, they had returned a no true bill and the chief justice of New York State changed New York law in the moment for the specific purpose of getting Bernard Getz. That same judge would later serve time in federal prison for, among other charges, federal kidnapping. Now, he wasn't convicted of the kidnapping charge. That was dismissed. He was ultimately convicted on other federal charges. Um, enough, of course, due time in federal prison. But we'll circle back to that detail in a moment. So <clears throat> what's the story of Bernard Getz? Well, Bernard Getz 
was uh, lived in New York City. Uh, he was riding the subway as he was wont to do, as most people in New York City do from time to time. And while he was on the subway, he was attacked by four young men. Um, three of them were 19 years old. One of them was 18 years old. These men were indisputably armed with weapons, sharpened screwdrivers on their way. They said they conceded. These four young men were on their way to rob a video arcade in Manhattan, the adjacent borough to Queens, um, where Bernard gets lived. Uh, when the train arrived in Manhattan, uh, they, that's where they got on the train. Um, these four young men, the last car in the line of subway cars. Uh, a short while later, Bernard gets entered, sat on a bench, and quickly became identified as a target by these four armed young men. They signaled to each other. They made gestures consistent with having weapons on their person, according to Getz's own testimony. And of course, weapons were ultimately found on their person. It wasn't just Getz's imagination. They stood up from their seats. They surrounded Bernard Getz, and they demanded money from him. Now, later, these four young men would say, oh, no, oh, don't make, don't mistake us. We weren't robbing Getz. We were panhandling. We were begging. It was merely a request for money. Well, folks, a request for money made under circumstances that a reasonable person would perceive as being accompanied by a threat to use violence, that's robbery. Armed violence, that's felony. Armed robbery. So these, these young men who by their own concession had armed themselves for the purpose of committing an armed robbery of a video arcade, uh, no reasonable person would believe that they were simply requesting, innocently requesting money from Bernard Getz. Bernard Getz perceived he was being subject to an armed robbery. Uh, now, as by the way, even if they didn't have weapons, the disparity of numbers, four against one, and, and Bernard Getz was a very slight man. He was not a large guy by any stretch of the imagination. Certainly not anyone who would be capable of defending himself against four young attackers. Few of us would be uh, outside of the movies. Bernard Getz had on his person a five-shot revolver. And he had that gun unlawfully. Now, why was he in unlawful possession of a gun? Well, he was in possession of a gun because he was in fear of his safety. Uh, he had previously been mugged and injured, physically injured, in an attack on a subway car in New York City. After that attack, he had determined he was going to arm himself with a gun so this wouldn't happen again, or at least he'd have an opportunity to defend himself if it did happen again. And being a law-abiding citizen, he applied to New York City for a concealed carry permit. And they denied that permit under New York's then-existing still existing, really, uh, although the recent Supreme Court Bruin decision ought to have put a stake through the heart of this provision of New York law, uh, New York law requiring, New York City law, requiring that you have a special reason to have a concealed carry permit, that you had a special reason, an exceptional reason, to uh, go about in public carrying a firearm for lawful purposes like self-defense, Generally, what this means is you need to be politically connected or be able to pay a sizable bribe in New York City in order to get a concealed carry permit. Uh, Bernard Getz was neither politically corrected, uh, connected nor rich enough to pay a sizable bribe. Um, and his special reason of I'd like to carry again so I'm not murdered by thugs on New York's violent subway system was deemed insufficient reason. So his concealed carry permit was denied. Being a prudent gentleman, uh, Bernard Getz decided, uh, well, he'd rather um, have the gun unlawfully and be able to defend himself than be murdered like a slaughtered pig in New York's subway system and have no means of self-defense. So he determined to carry the gun without the permit knowing he was doing so unlawfully per New York State's concealed carry law. And uh, presumably by now, all of you know that my personal position on all gun control laws is that they are preemptively, uh, they are pr presumptively unconstitutional, facially unconstitutional to the extent that any gun control law 
is preemptively applied to law-abiding, mentally sound American citizens who wish to carry arms on their person in public for lawful purposes. But nevertheless, I don't get to decide New York City's gun laws, unfortunately. And New York City's gun law said Bernard Goetz could not lawfully carry the gun that he was, in fact, carrying on his person. So Bernard Goetz is on the subway car. He's subject to an armed robbery, felony armed robbery by these four youths, all adults, by the way, 18 and 19 years old. My recollection is that they were all young black men. Could be wrong about that. Shouldn't matter, but that's the world we live in, unfortunately. And Bernard Goetz decides now he's the victim of an armed robbery. He's going to defend himself. So he takes out his revolver and he shoots each of the four armed robbers once and uh, fires a fifth shot which appears to have been a miss now this was in hot dispute at his later trial uh, the prosecution uh tried to uh, convict him on the grounds that the fifth shot was actually a hit and was unnecessary that the four shots had done the job uh, and the fifth shot therefore became excessive force this is not really a credible argument uh when all five shots are fired in quick succession but the prosecution claim was that four shots had put the four armed robbers down and then Getz had essentially fired the fifth shot as a kind of execution shot afterwards. Uh, so he uh, gets shot the gentlemen, uh, the four armed robbers against him, and one of whom uh, he paralyzed uh, for life. Uh, one of them, KB, was one of the armed suspects, severed his spinal cord. So let's see if I can recall exactly what the criminal charges ultimately were here. Boy, they do a good job of hiding them. So the initial charges were, none, none of the four men died. So the initial charges were attempted murder, four counts, assault, four counts, uh, this would be a, of course, felony assault with a gun. Uh, reckless endangerment. He's firing a gun on a subway car. Four counts of felony reckless endangerment. And one count of criminal possession of a weapon. Now, of course, as I said, the suspects, my recollection is they were four young black men. Bernard Goetz is as white as white can be. So we do have that unfortunate racial dynamic here that, again, should not matter. But for political purposes, that's the world we live in. So Getz is charged, four counts attempted murder, four counts felony assault, four counts reckless endangerment, one of criminal possession of a weapon, and the matter was presented to a grand jury. And the grand jury refused to indict Getz on any of the use of force charges. Now, what do we have here? We have a group of use of force charges the attempted murder, assault, reckless endangerment are use of force charges. They're charges based on the underlying use of force. And then we have a separate gun law charge, the criminal possession of a weapon. So it's important to keep these charges in those two buckets, use of force charges and the gun law charge. So the grand jury refused to indict Getz on any of the use of force charges. So he was not going to go to trial for attempted murder felony assault, or felony reckless endangerment. He was only going to go to trial on the criminal possession of a weapon charge. And frankly, he's kind of cooked on that one under New York law. These gun possession cases are possession cases. Possession cases are very easy to get a conviction on. You simply have to prove that the defendant was in possession of whatever the contraband was, whether it's drugs, child porn, prawn, I guess I should say, there goes my, I guess there goes my uh, algorithm for today's show uh so uh folks uh that statement alone that reference to um corn i'll say corn child corn uh almost certainly just got me demonetized by the algorithm so if you'd like to make that up by some super chats that would be greatly appreciated um but possession cases whether they are drugs illegal drugs or child corn or guns where you're not allowed to be in possession of the gun, the, the state need merely prove the possession, which generally is incontrovertible, and they've got the conviction. So Getz was pretty cooked on the criminal possession of a weapons charge, but of course the real criminal sentence, the real prison sentence, was going to come from 
the attempted murder, felony assault, and felony reckless endangerment charges. And the grand jury said, nope, they're off the table. We're not indicting, indicting on any of the use of force charges. Uh, so that's good news for Bornard Getz. The worst that's going to happen now is the gun charge, and it goes off from the grand jury to the trial court. As you might imagine, however, to the public that had been um, told that Bernard Getz was a racist uh, attempted killer of young black men, uh, that led to outrage in the public. And you have to keep in mind, folks, for those of you who live in normal parts of the country, in New York City, especially in the 1980s, uh, the perception of a gun was a gun was something that would be possessed in public only by some kind of aberrant person. It was would be the equivalent of walking around a subway car with live rattlesnakes hung around your neck. Um, th that would have been the visceral response of the public to the reports that Bernard gets a private citizen was armed with a revolver on a New York City subway. Um it was also claimed that Bernard Getz, when he fired the fifth shot, the so-called execution shot, into one of the four men, that he had looked down at that fallen young man and said, you don't look so bad, here's another shot, and fired that fifth, quote-unquote, attempted execution shot. Uh, Getz himself would argue that never happened. He would, he would um, state that perhaps he was thinking that in his head, Folks, another reason not to give statements to the police without your lawyer present, which is what Getz would later do, that's when he would tell police uh, that he was thinking in his head, you don't look so bad, here's another. Not that he said it out loud. Who knows? But in any case, obviously an extremely damaging statement to have on the record. So there was a lot of uh, public pressure to not let Getz get away with this. Of course, he wasn't getting away with anything. The, he'd followed the legal process. The grand jury had refused to indict on any of the use of force charges. Well, because of the public pressure, the uh, local DA, a highly politicized district attorney by the name of Robert Morgenthau at the time, uh, now, of course, deceased. Um, but Morgenthau announced to the public that he had a surprise new witness and they were, he was going to convene a new grand jury. Well, he did that. The surprise new witness was, guess what? One of the four young men who had attempted the armed robbery of Getz, who was available to testify in the first grand jury proceeding, but not, had not been presented to the first grand jury because he was a dirtbag. But now the, the district attorney felt compelled to salvage some kind of indictment of Getz on one of the use of force charges, so he convened a new grand jury in which testimony was now heard from the armed robber himself, one of the armed robbers themselves. This grand jury returned charges, use of force charges, on attempted murder, assault, and reckless endangerment, as well as the gun charge. And that indictment went now to the same trial court with the same judge, the same trial judge. That trial judge dismissed the use of force charges. For good reason. It was based on the notion that the prosecution had misstated the law to the grand jury. And they did. We'll get back to that in a moment. Uh, and also that this testimony from the armed robber himself uh, appeared to, there was strong evidence that they were perjuring themselves in the view of the trial court judge. <clears throat> so although this rigged second grand jury had done the district attorney's bidding and returned criminal charges on use of force, attempted murder, assault, felony recklessness, the trial judge dismissed the use of force charges. So we're back where we were before. Despite this second grand jury, uh, Getz once again is facing only the criminal charge of the gun possession. None of the use of force charges, just the gun law charge. And again, we had the same outrage again. Gets is, quote-unquote, getting away with something. Well, what did we have then? We had an issue here, a legal issue that came up. One of the reasons that the grand juries, the first grand jury, had um, not indicted Getz was because of Getz's history of having previously been mugged and injured on the New York City subway system. 
we talked earlier about this element of reasonableness. There's a subjective component and there's a objective com component. The subjective component is essentially, did the defender have a genuine good faith belief, subjective belief, that they were the imminent unlawful target of deadly force attack? Did they believe that in their head? And when you're evaluating that subjective belief, you're allowed the jury, whether it's a trial jury or grand jury, is allowed to take into consideration everything that defender knew, everything they had experienced up to the time they defended themselves. So one of those factors in Bernard Getz's mind at the time he's faced with these four armed young robbers was his prior mugging and physical injury that's known to him that's informing his decision making so the grand jury was allowed to consider that prior event because it informed bernard Getz's subjective perception of threat at the moment he defended himself against the four armed robbers that's the subjective half of reasonableness the objective half of reasonableness is would a reasonable and prudent person have shared that subjective belief. Both those questions must be answered yes to have the element of reasonableness and to have self-defense. Did the defender have a genuine good faith subjective belief they were facing a deadly force threat? Yes. Would a reasonable and prudent person in those circumstances have shared that subjective belief? That's the objective half of reasonableness. And that that theoretical, reasonable, and prudent person, they're supposed to be viewed, customized, again, for what the defender knew at the time, what they'd experienced up to the time. So it would be a reasonable and prudent person who had been himself subject to a prior mugging on the New York City subway system. That's what the first grand jury was told. And when the first grand jury was told that, and was allowed to consider Bernard Getz's prior mugging, they refused to indict Bernard Getz on any, any of the use of force charges, indicting only on the gun charge. With the second grand jury, the prosecution misinstructed the grand jury on the law. They did not allow the grand jury to consider Bernard Getz's prior mugging. Well, when you take that away, that important context, that subjective experience of Bernard Getz that informed his decision-making in the moment, that's one of the reasons that the grand jury returned an indictment. The second grand jury returned an indictment on the use of force charges. They were not allowed to consider Bernard Getz's first smugging. Well, <clears throat> Bernard Getz argued to the trial judge that that was a misstatement of New York law. And therefore, the trial judge should dismiss the use of force indictments by the second grand jury. And the trial judge agreed. That was a misstatement of New York law. New York law at the time said that the objective reasonableness standard considered the prior experiences of the defender. When the grand jury was told they couldn't do that, that was a misstatement of law. When they returned use of force indictments, on that basis, those indictments were defective and the trial judge dismissed them. What happened then? Did the district attorney of New York say, okay, we accept that? Of course not. The district attorney appealed that second dismissal of the use of force charges against Getz to New York's highest court. Now, strangely, it may seem to many of you, in most states, the highest court in a state is called the Supreme Court. New York does things differently. New York's Supreme Courts are actually their trial courts, the, the low, lowest level trial court, well, the lower level, the felony trial courts of New York State are called by New York State the Supreme Courts of the state. And of course, there are many of them. All the felony trial courts in New York are referred to as Supreme Courts in New York State. The highest court in New York State is re referred to as their Court of Appeals. So it's a little confusing. Uh, when we, when you're in New York State and you mention the Court of Appeals, you're actually talking about what would be called the Supreme Court of the state in most other states. But here we're talking about the Court of Appeals. It's the highest level jurisdiction court in New York State. 
So the district attorney sees these use of force charges against Bernard gets dismissed by the trial court because the trial court said the prosecution had misinformed the jury when they told the jury they were not allowed the grand jury when they had told the grand jury they're not allowed to consider gets his prior mugging. And the district attorney appeals this up to the Court of Appeals, the highest court in New York State. And the Court of Appeals comes up with a new version of New York State law. The chief justice of the Court of Appeals is one Judge Sol Wachler at the time. He writes the decision for the Court of Appeals. And he says, no, no, no. Uh, I understand that really for the entire history of New York State, since the revolution, the legal standard has been that objective reasonableness allows for consideration of the defender's prior experiences. But I'm changing that rule. And I'm changing it retroactively to apply to Bernard Getz. Although that was the law as it existed at the time Bernard Getz defended himself, that any jury would be allowed to consider his prior mugging, I'm now creating a new law for New York State from the bench saying that it's okay if the grand jury or any jury is told not to consider his prior mugging. That's permitted. And with that change in law made retroactively by Chief Justice Sol Wachler from the Court of Appeals bench, the use of force charges came back into play and were argued at Bernard Getz's trial. So the use of force charges had been rejected by the first grand jury. They'd been returned by the second grand jury under a misstatement of the law and then rejected by the trial court. And then because of this court of appeals retroactive change in New York state law, a third grand jury was allowed to return again indictments under this misstatement of the law. And those indictments were, the trial court was compelled to accept indictments on the use of force trials. So Bernard Getz goes to criminal trial with the use of force charges, the attempted murder, the felony assault, and the felony reckless endangerment charges, as well as the gun charge. That's how hard the state prosecutors worked to get those use of force charges against Getz into trial. They had the chief justice of the state retroactively change near, longstanding near state law to drag kicking and screaming those use of force charges into trial court. Now, as it happens, when these use of force charges were argued to the actual trial jury, guess what happened? They acquitted him, acquitted him, not guilty on every one of those use of force charges. But they convicted him on the gun charge, criminal possession of a weapon in the third degree. Again, these possession gun crimes, very easy to prove. Was Bernard Getz in possession of the gun? That was uncontested. Even Bernard Getz said, obviously I was in possession of the gun. I said I shot him. So once possession is proved, you're in effect guilty of these possession crimes. You all not be in gun cases based on a proper reading of constitutional law. Bernard Getz should have had to explain to absolutely nobody, require nobody's permission to have a revolver on that subway. But nevertheless, they convicted him of the gun charge, but acquitted him of every one of the use of force charges. So he shot those four young men and the jury said, that's self-defense. Acquitted not guilty on all the use of force charges, but given the nature of the gun charge, they were obliged to find them guilty of the gun charge. And then the trial judge sentenced them to six months in jail and some probation and some community service time and a variety of other small things, nothing very important. <clears throat> six months. That's not bad for having shot four people and faced the kind of heat that Bernard Getz was facing. He was looking at life in prison without possibility of early release, and he got six months. Well, of course, the prosecution and the public couldn't accept this either. By the public, I mean a New York City public driven to madness by the media misreporting of this event and this trial. Um, so they appealed his sentence and actually got his sentence increased to a full year without probation by the appellate courts. 
Does it sound like the prosecution was dead set on getting Getz as much as possible, throwing the book at Getz as much as possible? They sure were. <clears throat> so could that have happened, to circle back, could that same dynamic have been at play in this security guard shooting by Enoch Wilson of criminal suspect Lorenzo? Could the prosecution have said, you know what? Listen, it looks like self-defense. We don't think we can overcome a self-defense argument here, not even close. But he did commit a gun crime, so we're going to go after him on the gun crime. And would they have gotten a conviction on the gun crime if they wanted one? Again, it's just a possession crime. Was Wilson in possession of the gun absent the required valid permit? It's, it's not contested. They can easily get a conviction on the gun charge. They're simply using their discretion not to. By the way, that same Chief Justice, Sol Wachler, um, would, uh, who changed the law retroactively in order to allow these use of force charges to go against um, Bernard Getz, go to trial, uh, he would have an interesting uh, heary uh, future after this all, all happened. Uh, that chief judge, Saul Wachler, would be indicted in 1992, <clears throat> less than a decade after this happened, folks. This happened in 1984. <clears throat> so only eight years later, Chief Judge, ju judge Saul Wachler, the highest judge in New York State, the judge who, who authored the decision that retroactively changed New York state law on self-defense purely so Bernard Getz could be prosecuted on use of force charges. Eight years after he did that, he was indicted for extortion, racketeering, blackmail of his mistress. And he would be charged with attempted or threatened kidnapping of his mistress's child. on federal charges. Now here, of course, on uh, Wikipedia, it merely says that subsequently Judge Wachler resigned as a judge uh, from, <clears throat> as a judge and from the bar. Uh, he was in fact convicted in federal court of criminal charges and sentenced to federal prison. So he did federal prison time. And when he got out of federal prison, guess what happened? He was hired by a law school in New York City to be a law professor. This is the guy who authored the retroactive change in New York state law that subjected Bernard Getz to attempted murder charges, to felony assault charges, to felony reckless endangerment charges in a criminal trial in New York City. And thank God for the jury deciding that they had not been convinced that those charges had been proven beyond a reasonable doubt and acquitting Getz on all those charges. So folks, when, when you go hands-on, in a fight, I mentioned this earlier, you're incurring two risks you were not incurring a moment before. One of them is dying in that fight. Like the first security guard did here. He got shot and killed by the suspect, Lorenzo. You think he was expecting to die when he was escorting Lorenzo out of that store for not following store policy? That in a few minutes he would be dead in that parking lot in front of his place of employment? Of course he wasn't. But that's where he ended up. That was his last few minutes of life on this earth. So one of the risks you incur the moment you go hands-on is the prospect of dying in that fight. Another risk is the prospect of ending up spending the rest of your life in a cage, getting convicted of a crime that potentially carries life in prison without possibility of early release. And, and whether or not that happens is no longer up to you once you're engaged in the fight. Your fate is now in the hands of other people, in the hands of police, in the hands of prosecutors, in the hands of a jury, in the hands of a judge, and not just a trial jury, but a grand jury, and not just a trial judge, but arguably appellate court judges as well. In this case, the chief judge of the state intervened in the Bernard Getz trial to ensure that these use of force charges could be brought to trial against Bernard Getz, despite a first grand jury refusing to indict, despite the trial judge dismissing the use of force indictments from a second grand jury that had been misinstructed on the law, 
You think Bernard Getz ever thought that when he defended himself in a subway car that the chief justice of the state would orchestrate his prosecution on use of force charges personally, retroactively? Of course he didn't. But one of the consequences Bernard Getz was subject to after he got engaged in the fight was this legal process. That's not within his control. It's within the control of other people, and those other people may not have your interests at heart. Now, I'm not telling you not to fight back. I'm not telling you what to do. I never tell people what to do. There are circumstances that make it reasonable to incur the risk of death and the risk of life in prison. Such circumstances exist. If I didn't believe that, I wouldn't carry a gun for personal protection, and I do carry a gun for personal protection and have every day of my adult life. But it's not a long list of things that are worth the risk of death and the risk of life in prison. It's a short list. Now, what that list is for you is something only you can decide. I can't decide that for you, and I wouldn't if I could. But I do urge you to think about it today before you're looking at the fight because we don't tend to make better decisions under stress. We tend to make worse decisions under stress. Make those decisions now. Know what your list is now. So if the worst happens, if the worst happens, it was still worth it. The stakes were worth the risks. And you know that because you thought about it well ahead of time. All right, folks. So I'm going to start looking at the comments now. So if you'd like a comment answered on YouTube, you do need to put it in super chat form. Uh, I am going to look at the questions that have come in. Oh, good. It looks like everything's streaming correctly on the Law of Self-Defense member site. They get their questions answered first because they're Law of Self-Defense members. And let's see if there's anything on uh, Rumble. It looks like there's, it looks like there's not. Um, yeah, it looks like, it looks like Rumble did not work correctly, folks. I am getting very, very tired of working with Rumble. I get lots of glitches there, and I have to pay to use Rumble. So Rumble may not be long for law of self-defense, unfortunately. I'd love to have an alternative to YouTube, trust me. But I'm not sure Rumble is, uh, is up to it as yet. <clears throat> All right, so before I jump into the questions, let me mention once again that today's content, today's show is brought to all of you by no other than Law of Self-Defense itself. Uh, this is our book, our physical book, The Law of Self-Defense Principles. It's not just a PDF download, folks. It's a physical book. You can find it on Amazon. It's got over a 1,000 reviews, solid five-star rating. The foreword is by Masayub, folks. That's a pretty good um, affirmation of the quality of the book, as well as the reviews on Amazon. If you buy it on Amazon, they will charge you $25 for the book and shipping and handling. I will give you the book for free. I do ask that you still cover the cost of getting the book to you. So I do ask that you pay the shipping and handling, but I'll eat the cost of the book. You can get the book for free at lawofselfdefense.com slash free book lawofselfdefense.com slash free book. Any of you in the comments who have the book and have enjoyed it, feel free to say uh, nice things in the comments for the others. Okay. So let's look at, see if there's a member questions here. Uh, oh, it looks like, uh, it looks like the show was not streaming properly on the Law of Self-Defense member site either. <clears throat> But uh, it looks like hopefully people flipped over to YouTube to watch it there. Sorry about that, members. But we do have a, a statement here from one of our members. Uh, Joe writes, one of my then coworkers was a good friend of Bernie Getz, and I spoke to Bernie and met him a few times not long after he was acquitted of the non-gun charges. Nice guy. He didn't deserve what the system did to him. Uh, he certainly didn't deserve what the system did to him. It was a politically motivated prosecution. Uh, during uh, some of the worst periods of crime in New York City and in the subway system uh, in general. Um, it's, it's hard to say what he could have done differently other than simply not living in New York City, frankly. Uh, but yes, a, a real disservice to him. He was also civilly sued, by the way, uh, and a judgment against him was granted um, 
in civil court to the tune of tens of millions of dollars. And of course, he never paid a penny of it. I mean, Bernie Getz was not a man of means to begin with. He was just an ordinary person. Um, he really spent everything he had just on the criminal defense. Um, and so you can't bleed, uh, squeeze blood from a stone. Uh, Bernie Getz never had any money the rest of his life. I, I don't know if he's still alive or not. Um, and certainly not money that could satisfy any kind of any judgment. I, I doubt he could have paid a thousand dollar judgment, much less a judgment uh, on the scale of tens of millions of dollars. So very unfortunate there. All right, let me take a look now at the uh, super chats and see what we have. Supers, supers. Uh, only a couple. All right. Rodzilla, $5 super chat. Thank you very much. Asks, have, have you read USA vs. Hoover motion to dismiss the most excellent takedown of the legality of the NFA? Check it out. Only nine pages. I, I have not read USA v. Hoover. Uh, NFA, of course, folks, would be the National Firearms Act, one of the two major uh, federal gun control statutes. Uh, the other is the GCA, the Gun Control Act. Uh, but folks, uh, I, I might read USA v. Hoover uh, if I'm on a flight sometime and I have extra free time to do that, but I don't really do gun law. So I do use of force law. When, under what circumstances are you privileged to use force in defense of yourself, others, or property? And in that context, the precise manner of the force is really unimportant. Uh, use of force law cares a lot about the degree of force, the proportionality of force, whether we're talking non-deadly force or deadly force, uh, but it doesn't really care about the means of force. So in the deadly force realm, for example, use of force law doesn't really care if the deadly force was a gun or a knife or a piano dropped from a great height or your automobile or the, the precise means are generally unimportant. Uh, what it cares about a lot is whether or not you were privileged to use deadly force at all. But if you were, all deadly force is essentially equivalent to all other deadly force. Now, as a practical matter, most deadly force uh, events involve the use of a gun or a knife or a weapon, but they need not. Uh, Bare-handed attacks can be deadly force. You can use your car as a deadly defensive force instrument. You could arguably shove somebody out a 30-story window in self-defense, and uh, then I guess you're using gravity as your deadly force weapon. Um but when it comes to gun law, I have to defer to other legal experts who are experts in that specific niche of gun law, which is controls things like what kind of guns can you have, under what circumstances, the nature of the gun, when does a piece of metal become a gun, uh, where can you carry, how can you carry, when and how can you transfer, all that gun stuff, uh, concealed carry rules, magazine capacity rules, all that stuff. I don't claim any particular expertise in gun law. I know enough gun law to make sure that me personally, as a law abiding citizen who carries a gun for personal protection, what I need to know to stay within the law myself. Um, but that's pretty constrained uh, to my circumstances. Uh, Mexican Iron Man, $10 super chat. Thank you very much. Donation to the Fight the Algorithm Fund. Keep up the great work. Well, thank you very much. My pleasure. Uh, G Man. Hey, Branka, I got soft. Oh, $5 super chat from G-Man. Thank you very much. I got soft, but planning to get my cousin hard for Christmas. Would you consider posting some firing range videos? Um, <clears throat> so, uh, by the way, folks, we also have a... Uh, do I have a copy handy? I do. I mentioned our uh, free book offer. A moment before where you can get a did i just lose my audio there we go you can get a free copy of the law of self-defense picked up it post it law of self-defense get that for free just pay the shipping and handling at law of self-defense.com slash free book we also have a beautiful hard copy version of the book you can get this hardcover copy beautiful looks great on the on the uh, bookshelf, uh, makes a great gift, folks. Um, you can get the, we don't give this away for free. They cost too much to print, unfortunately, but you can get your hard copy of the Law of Self-Defense at lawofselfdefense.com slash get hard. lawofselfdefense.com slash get hard, the hard copy of the book. There you go. For those of you interested in 
that. So um, firing range video. So here's an uh, interesting uh, trivia point. Uh, for the first time in many, many years, this weekend, I'm actually taking a defensive shooting course uh, being taught by um, uh, the Modern Samurai Project is the uh, school teaching. Uh, they happen to be teaching uh, near proximity to my home. I really just don't have the time anymore to travel to classes. I've taken many, many dozens of shooting courses, but I've been too busy the last 10 or 15 years to, to do much organized competitive shooting or take courses, unfortunately. But I am having the uh, enjoyable opportunity to take a course from the Modern Samurai Project uh, this weekend. So I'm really looking forward to that. I may take some photos there uh, you know, to share on social media, generally Instagram photos on Twitter, that kind of thing. The problem with putting gun video on YouTube is the algorithm doesn't like it. And my mission with this content is to get it out to as many people as possible. Um, and to do that, I have to do what I can to fool the YouTube algorithm into sharing the content. I mean, it's not up to me how far this, these YouTube videos get spread. It's up to YouTube. You folks can help, by the way, by hitting that subscribe button. So if you're not yet a subscriber, if that button is red, uh, please smash that button. Turn it gray. Uh, hit the bell to make sure you get notifications. Hit that thumbs up uh, icon, uh, the like icon. Uh, leave a comment. Even if it's just your city and state, the more comments, the more engagement, I guess they call it, uh, helps fool the YouTube algorithm into sharing things more broadly. So if you can help with all of that, it's all free, folks. Uh, that would be greatly appreciated. Tell your friends and family you like this content. Direct them to lawofselfdefense.com slash YouTube or youtube.com slash law of self-defense, either will work. Um, and we can fool the algorithm. When, when I put a, uh, an actual gun video within my YouTube videos, they get demonetized. Um, and when they get demonetized, it's not just that it costs me money. Frankly, I don't really care about the monetization money on, on YouTube. Uh, I, YouTube is not my business. My business is the books and the courses and my legal consulting work. Uh, YouTube is just a way to make people aware of all that other stuff. I'm not a, um, a traditional law tuber whose business is YouTube. I, I, that, that's not my business model. Uh, I'm just here to spread word of my what is my business model, uh, the books, the courses, the legal consulting to, to all of you. Uh, so I don't really care about getting demonetized per se. I'm not on YouTube. I mean, I think I'll make $20, $30 in Super Chats this show. I mean, big deal. Uh, thank you, of course, for everything you can offer and support. I do appreciate it. I'm not trying to minimize your contribution when you make a super chat, but obviously that's not the reason I'm, I'm spending almost an hour and a half with all of you here today. I'm spending an hour and a half, not for the YouTube money, but to share my knowledge and expertise with all of you. The trouble with being demonetized is not the money for me. It's when you're demonetized, well, then YouTube does not want to spread your content because YouTube makes money by running ads on your content. And if they're not going to run ads on your content, there's no reason for YouTube to promote that content broadly because they don't make any money by promoting your demonetized content. So that's the risk. And I, I know, I know there are other, they're like gun centric YouTube channels that show guns all the time. I'm not sure how they deal with this issue. Uh, but my mission here is to try within reasonable constraints to align my content with what the YouTube algorithm likes on YouTube so I can get this message out more broadly. Sorry about that. It's uh, the best I can do. Um, I'm Again, it's a little different on Twitter, I think, or at least I, I care less about Twitter. Uh, it's a, different on Instagram, I think, but I care less about Instagram. Um, so I'll do what I can. But if you don't see me posting gun videos on here, it's not because I don't want to. It's because YouTube uh, intentionally makes it counterproductive for me to do that. All right. And one more check for Super Chats. See if anything new has come in the last few minutes. And there is one, Michelle C. Michelle C. A very generous $20 Super Chat. Thank you. Uh, she writes, great show. Your approach to explaining a situation is the best, easy to follow and understand, perhaps due to your teaching experience. Thanks for the content. Well, thank you very much, Michelle. I really appreciate that. Um, and for folks recommending other social media platforms as alternatives to uh, YouTube, folks, I'm just a small town lawyer. I'm not a 
social media expert. Working with Rumble is a real pain in the butt. Uh, TikTok, I've never used in my life. I wouldn't know how. Uh, I try from time to time to work with these other social media platforms. They, they're just so cumbersome and, and non-intuitive. It's, it's not that easy. Uh, maybe we need to hire someone for that purpose. I don't know. I'm open to that. We talk about it here on my end from time to time. Uh, we'll see. If any of you have expertise in that stuff and would like to throw your hat in the ring for you know, you know contract work or something like that, you don't have to move to Colorado where I am. Uh, you know, feel free to message us. You can always message us at support at law of self uh, if you'd like to, uh, you know, work with us on that kind of stuff. I, I certainly do appreciate other people's expertise. All right, folks, I think that's all I have for today. We do have a big lineup of content, uh, coming up. So let me, given that this is Friday, let me take just a moment as we get up to the top of the half hour to share with you some of the content we have coming up early next week so that you are, are aware of what's coming up and can make appropriate plans to join us. Uh, let me, I hadn't planned on doing this, so let me pull up these files so I can share them with you. We have three shows already scheduled for next week that I think many of you will find interesting. So I'll give you a quick overview of those here. This is for Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday next week. Uh, they're already scheduled on YouTube. So you can hit that remind me <clears throat> button. Uh, if you click over to um, youtube.com slash law self-defense, you ought to see them listed there. But we have a show coming up on Monday. Uh, can you fire your lawyer? So there's a decision out of uh, the appellate courts of Montana involving a criminal defendant in a use of force case who uh, didn't like his trial lawyer and tried to fire him. Well, can you fire your lawyer? And we'll also talk about whether or not your lawyer can fire you, by the way. Um, but can you just fire your lawyer? Or are you stuck with your lawyer, even if you think your lawyer is doing a bad job? So the answer to that, you may find surprising. That's Monday's show. That'll be Monday at 4 p.m. Eastern time. I am trying to, I mean, obviously we didn't do it today. This is a morning show. I am trying to um, let's see. That was the wrong. I've got the wrong file here. Hold on one second. Okay. I am trying to uh, regularize our schedule for the afternoons for 4 p.m. Eastern time just for everybody's uh, convenience. Okay, here we go. So <clears throat> that was the first one. That's Monday's show. Can you fire your lawyer? Tuesday's show. Oops. When bystanders are shot, what are the legal consequences? So you use your gun in self-defense uh, and you manage to hit a bystander or maybe the bad guy you're defending yourself against. He fires a shot and hits a bystander. What are the legal consequences for you if a bystander is injured, killed, when you're acting in self-defense? What are the legal consequences criminally? What are the legal consequences civilly? And if you think a good Samaritan law will protect you from criminal liability in this circumstance, you are mistaken. I'll, I'll Spoiler, good Samaritan laws protect you from civil liability, not from criminal liability. So even if your state's Good Samaritan law would take you off the hook for civil damages, if you unintentionally hit a bystander, that doesn't mean you're not criminally liable, which of course is what we ought to be most concerned about. So that's Tuesday's show. Oops, when bystanders are shot, the legal consequences. And then Wednesday's show, already planned, scheduled for Wednesday on our YouTube channel is... Law of Defense of Others. 
So defense of others uh, is in the news now, of course, because we just had that um, Greenwood Mall shooting in Indiana. That was an active shooting scenario. But the young man who fired those amazing eight hits out of 10 rounds at 40 yards was acting in defense, not really of himself, but in defense of others. At 40 yards, he was mostly acting in defense of others, and thank God for it. Uh, but defense of others comes in different flavors, uh, in my opinion, my professional opinion. There's defense of people you know, defense of family and friends. There's defense of strangers. And then there's defense of others in an active shooting scenario. And I think each of those needs to be understood as separate categories of defense of others because there are different uh, legal and practical implications that flow from those different scenarios. So that'll be Wednesday's show, July 27th, again at 4 p.m. Eastern time. And I do urge you, head over to our YouTube channel and click on each of those and click the notify me button on them to make sure you don't miss those, uh, that you can participate live. Uh, and again, if you participate live and you have questions throughout the course of the show, I'll be happy to answer those if you put them in super chat form. All right, folks, that is, I think that is it for today. I do have to start getting my gear ready for this uh, shooting class this weekend with um, Modern Samurai Project. Really looking forward to that. It's been a long time. Uh, they told me to bring a thousand rounds of uh, ammo for my um, my SIG 365 XL 9 millimeter pistol, which is my daily carry pistol. Uh, has a hollow sun sight on it. That's what I'll be using for the course. And uh, We'll see. I've got soft, soft office hands these days. I don't have the calluses I used to have uh, on my fingers from the incessant uh, dry firing and competition firing I used to do as an active competitive shooter. I will be bringing tape with me to tape up my fingers as they, my hands start coming apart. Uh, if I'm firing a thousand rounds of ammo over the course of two days, I do expect my hands to uh, pay the price for that, given that I've let them get soft. Uh, but I expect it to be a lot of fun as well. All right, folks, I'll just remind all of you uh, in passing to uh, remember if you carry a gun, so you're hard to kill. That's why I carry a gun. So I'm hard to kill. So my family is hard to kill. Then you also owe it to yourself and your family to make sure you know the law. So you're hard to convict until next time. I remain attorney Andrew Branca for law of self-defense. Stay safe.